Howdy, how's it going? My name's Davy Chappie, and if you've been following along with my last two Goblin videos, then you'll be happy to know that this here is the third and final edition in the Star Wars Goblin Trilogy, and it's gonna focus on the Host, a mighty army comprised of every Goblin type in order to serve Maglubiot's will. As always, keep in mind that a lot of this is just my opinion, so if you feel that tug in your mind telling you to murder your enemies in different ways, feel free to wage war however you want. And real quick, I want to give a shout out to my new patrons this month. Sigma File, Rhea Weston, Zachary Vance! For research, the Aussie Brit, Death by Chair, Bobbity Hobbity, Sharp Hand Joe, Jacob Watkins, Home Slice, Egg. Thank you all so much for being my new patrons. I'm sure you'll love me only half as much as I love me as well. But with that out of the way, let's begin. So the Goblinoid Host is the final form of Goblinoid Society. It is the holy, righteous, and divine point where brotherhoods are forged, gobboys become gobmen, and glory exists to be won and lost. But to explain what the Host is, I have to explain why the Host is. See, when all three of the Goblinoid races meet each other, for whatever reason, all of their eyes lock for a moment as they realize that Maglubiot's divine will has brought them together. It is at this point that they shirk off the bounds of individuality and come together to form the mighty Morphin Power Goblins, fighting crime, conquering lands, and gathering as many other goblinoids as possible with the eventual goal of perhaps establishing a new goblinoid nation for all of goblin kind. But the Big M doesn't just form all these disciples together because he wants all of his adopted children to play nice with each other. He does it because when a host forms, he watches intently, training his eye on each and every being within that host, and those goblinoids who prove their worth to him will, upon death, be invited to join his army of immortals, the personal magic Glubietti army that eternally serves him on the warfaring plain of Acheron, in this never-ending fight against Grumsh, the patron god of the orcs. It is this highest honor that pushes the red, green, and yellow boys to keep their conquering host going for as long as possible, offering as many chances as they can for their people to make Daddy Maggie proud. And in the name of keeping the host going for as long as possible, each race shrugs off its old way of life and adopts a new one, much like how one moves out of their parents' house and learns to live in that flat with some other vague acquaintances. For the Hobgoblin, that means dropping any animosity between legions, and for those legions that didn't originate originate the host, allowing the main legion to act as the military top dogs, with only the warlords of the other legions having the authority to ask anything of the main one. Other than that, the Hobgoblin way of life goes relatively unscathed, although they do keep records of anybody that throws an insult their way so that, if the host is ever disbanded, they know who to dick punch. Bugbears adapt relatively easily as well, taking up specialist positions where their skills are only called upon in times of need, so that they can spend the rest of their day doing all the nothing that they could want. These specialist positions can be as thugs, where they'll launch themselves over the enemy army and start flailing their arms around only for bugbears that make up the bulwark to charge in with spiked shields when the enemy turns to wonder what the hell just happened, or they could be conscripted as murderers, who make up for their lack of naming conventions by being really sneaky and stabbing anybody who doesn't like their naming conventions. Although, as always, it's just a matter of getting them to move. In fact, despite willingly joining Maglubiot's host, the act of getting them off of their big yellow asses still requires incentive in the form of shiny armor and weapons, food, or even the occasional enemy leader head fashioned to a pike. Goblins, however, are the ones whose lives are changed rather abruptly. When they were left to their own devices, Giblins would instinctively form up into their own tribe with a caste system, taking into account that some goblins just weren't any good at fighting. Once they've been absorbed into the host, however, that caste system is destroyed, with both the gatherer and pariah roles, 86th and any goblins that used to be a part of those roles upgraded immediately to hunters, upon which they are to be trained as proper soldier and put to good use in the host army. The old chief is made little more than a figurehead that literally any hobgoblin or bugbear could just walk up to and boss around, and they only even get to keep their titles so that the goblins have some sort of organization in their lives, even if the rapid change in lifestyle will turn the once slapstick comedy goblins into roots ruthless killing machines, devoid of any humorous antics that would have previously been found. For them, life sucks, there's only war, and they're likely to be eaten by tyranny. I mean bugbears. But, in addition to hobos, gobbos, and bugs, a conquering host usually has some auxiliary help in the form of wolves and wargs to ride on, as well as dangerous creatures that the host has managed to capture, such as cockatrices, or even a hydra that has a goblin steering each head. And if the host has been successful enough to take over a town, it might even have humanoids. See, when a host dominates a people, they treat it differently than an orc tribe or a knoll warband besieging a village, or even an individual hobgoblin or a goblin group slaughtering the inhabitants. Instead, when a host defeats its enemies in battle, it prefers to occupy the village and allow the people to simply continue living their lives, just under the watchful eye of the new goblinoid ownership. Warriors are invited into the army because game recognizes game, either through coercion or by threatening to murder all that they know and love, and for the most part, as long as a village continually pumps out resources and supplies that get to go straight into the goblinoid machine, they are treated as second-class citizens instead of downright being tortured and murdered. Still totally slaves, but hey, maybe they'll be saved by a group of four or five plucky young heroes with attitude. 
The only people who don't get this option for indentured servitude are the worshippers of gods. See, Maglubiet is a sort of no one can play with my toys kind of guy, and his drive to stomp out all other deities in the multiverse extends to his goblinoids, who will actually target and focus their attention on any paladins or clerics who are found on the battlefield. As for these priests who aren't combat ready but still find themselves subjugated by the host, they are offered two choices accept Maglubiet as the true and only good lord and savior, or be forced to fight for your life in a never ending gauntlet of angry zealots until you're inevitably granted the honor of meeting your god in person and then they'll burn your house down. And if they manage to conquer enough villages, towns, even cities, then the goblinoid host may eventually lead into a true goblinoid nation, one where they have effectively established their own country where all of goblinkind can live in peace and harmony. That is, until the host stops winning battles, in which case the goblinoids take that as a sign that Maglubiet has stopped guiding them, and then decide to break off, with hobgoblin legions immediately turning on each other and battling forever, bugbears killing off all the influential leadership and stealing their heads, and all the little goblins running away into the forest to go back to their normal lives, shouting Booyah to make the magic happen, and waiting for the natural cycle of life to turn back to the day where they may go to war once again. But that'll about do it! I hope you enjoyed this trilogy of videos. Feel free to like bugbears, comment on goblins, and subscribe to the Hobgoblin point of view, and maybe throw some money into the Patreon pod if you think it's a good idea to give money to the guy who made his job into talking about goblins for a month. But yeah, Davy out.